Hello and welcome to Cantrip Conversations. And yes, today we are doing a video style if you're watching on YouTube. That's right, finally a video style which was much requested by a lot of people. My name is Brandon Tharp, <laughs> the Dungeon Master for We Cantrip D&D Podcast. And if you're listening to this on YouTube or watching this on YouTube now, thank you very much. If you're listening on one of our podcast platforms, however, you can hear this a week early if you uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. So you should probably go and do that so you can get the uh, the full experience a week early of these. But anyways, today I am joined by a pretty good friend of ours, Carlos from Plus five to charisma or sorry just plus five charisma on instagram how's it going man um pretty good thank you so much so carlos runs an instagram page called plus five charisma on you know instagram and it's really really cool he's got like what like what almost seven thousand followers on there something like that yeah um approaching seven thousand awesome so can you tell us a little bit about what you do on that page like what kind of stuff do you post i know it's a lot of uh you know, like D&D supply, like content type stuff that you, you know, kind of like think to yourself and come up with. But like, let's uh, give the listeners a little insight on what you do. Um, so for me, it's mainly every time that I want to run the game and it feels like it's really complicated because I have so many ideas in my head. Um, I feel like I should just go ahead and start writing all the ideas down and trying to play the game with whatever I have right in front of me. Uh, so as opposed to making it super complicated, what I want to do is, as soon as I come up with an idea, uh, transform it into a post. Hopefully somebody will get inspired from that and apply it into their campaigns. Uh, that's the best way to explain it. So if anybody ever has an idea for a D&D campaign, a game, or something that you're running, just feel free to check the Instagram page for any idea that you may look could be a trinket, it could be a magic item, it could be a spell you want to use, an NPC, a story hook, uh, drinks, food, whatever it is that you need for your campaign, just feel free to go on the Instagram, uh, get inspired from all the posts. Um, I've done about 100 posts by now, and they're all different styles, so it's mainly for people to get inspired and play the game. Yeah, you've got possible. a lot of really cool stuff on there. I was actually going through it again today, just you know, see what you know, was on there, because there's some new stuff I hadn't seen yet. Um, but when we first got in contact with you, um, you know, I, you know, one of my friends followed the page through our account. I went through, saw the stuff. I'm like, this is really good stuff. Like it was really interesting, really cool. And I wanted to use a lot of it too. And I'm like this, like the NPC ideas, the, the quest hooks, the plot hooks. I'm like, this is really good. And then, um, eventually for you listeners out there, we ended up messaging, um, Carlos here on Instagram and we, uh, got together about what a few days ago, over the weekend, right? Saturday, Friday or Saturday of this week. I think so. I don't even know what day it is. It yeah, is it today's. Wednesday? I don't know, dude. I'm so busy right now. I have no idea what day it is. Anyway, today's Wednesday. I think. Yeah, today's Wednesday. I think we talked like on Friday. Uh, Greg was here with us, and we, you know, pretty much worked so. together, and we we put together a uh, like kind of a plot hook type thing and a story idea for like a little brainstorming exercise, and it was really cool. It was really fun, and we got to see a little bit of the uh, the insight and the process of what you do when you do this kinds of things, and it's very cool. Um, and I think that's what we're actually going to do here in a little bit, um, just to kind of give the viewers and <laughs> listeners an idea of like how you go about this and, uh, you know, awesome. they can give an, uh, a teaser of what you kind of do on your channel or at your uh, Instagram page. Um, uh, before we do that, um, why don't you go ahead and tell people your story about D and D, like what got you into it, why you play, um, just something I kind of do with everybody whenever I do these. Cause I feel like a lot of people like hearing people's personal D and D stories and why they started and what got them into it. So why don't you go ahead and give us a little insight on that? How uh, how long should I take? Should I take like a, a two minute explanation, a five minute one? Uh, two to five minutes is fine. Yeah, two to five minutes. Yeah, we'll we'll keep it in that range. The that way we can uh, get to the good elevator stuff. Pitch. Um, so I I was introduced to Dungeons and Dragons twice in my life. Um, the very first time. Um, so I'm native from Colombian. Spanish is my first language which at the time when I was introduced to Dungeons and Dragons for the very first time, I was about 10 or 12 years old. Um, I didn't speak any English. I could read a little bit and understand, but um, I wasn't very fluent, as, at least not as well as I am now, as good as I am now. And then we got the game. Our parents brought, uh, bought it for us, for me and my brothers, for Christmas. And then we managed to read the rules and create some characters. However, um, and my brothers and I, I'll, I guess I'll do a, a parenthesis, we have loved board games 
since, I don't know, as far as I can remember, we played, well, all the basics, Monopoly, Clue, Risk, uh, but eventually you graduate from those board games into Settlers of Catan and mm. they start going yeah, into... Yeah, the more hardcore stuff, yeah. Correct. And then when we were little, we got, I think, our very first, I guess, level up was Dungeons & Dragons. Uh, we always wanted to play. We kind of understood that you go in an adventure and create a fantasy character but we didn't know and this was the very first time that a game needed somebody to run the game for you that was a complete brand new concept for us that nobody had ever explained to us or we didn't have experience with it we had not had experience before so when we tried to play the game we didn't know we had our characters but nobody could run the game for us and we didn't know that we needed somebody to run the game for us so we kind of just tossed it to the side and just kept playing mm. the usual board games that we had at the time. So that was 10, 12 years old. I guess that was about 18 years ago. So if you fast forward 18 years, uh, last year my brother bought uh, the, uh, the books for 5th edition, uh, Dungeons and Dragons, which are, the books are just beautiful. Uh, they just oh, grab they're, Yeah, they're eye candy. They're great them. to look at, yeah. So he brought him home, he brought the player's handbook, uh, the dungeon master guide, and the monster manual, and that's pretty much all you need. Um, he did a one-shot campaign, we created characters, and I kind of fell in love with the idea of running the game. Like, I saw him running the game, and I was like, I have so many ideas and so many the wheels in my head started turning. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I know how to set this up. I know how to have players on the other side of the table, and I know how to run a story for them. I, it, it kind of all started clicking together. Um, so with that in mind, I started playing Dungeons & Dragons then again in my, in my late 20s, uh, which was last year, all the way until now. I probably run about 20 to 30 sessions, and it's always been with family and friends. Uh, I haven't done it for any strangers that I've met. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, so it's always people within the family um, and a couple of co-workers, um, but they no longer play. I don't think it's like their type Not of game. Not their thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like it's, a, it's fine for a couple of times, but it's not something that they're willing to make into a hobby. Yeah, I feel like it's... I. Personally, I feel like Dungeons and Dragons is one of those games where no, it's not for everybody. But I do feel like everybody should maybe at least try it once in their life, or maybe not just Dungeons and Dragons, but any kind of like tabletop RPG game that's like similar to D and D, like whether it's Pathfinder or Call of Cthulhu. I feel like everybody should at least try it once because there was always this, always like this big stigma behind like D and D and like you know D and D players where it's like, oh, that's super nerdy and geeky. Like, why are you doing that? Like, that's for like hardcore nerds. But now it's like fast forward to 2019, like today's society. Like, the game is, like, super popular, like, popularized around, like, all of media. Like, it's on TV shows now. Mm -hmm. Like, Stranger Things promotes the shit out of it with, like, all the stuff they do. Like, there's a bunch of stuff that goes on in the game or, like, just, you know, like, in media now where the game is so popularized that more and more people play it. And I think that's partially due because people start to see, like, and understand why the game is as popular as it is. Because you can't get with D&D &D what you get with, like, other, like, video games and stuff. Like, the experience is just, like, different. Like you said, like, it's a game where... The game is run by somebody else. It's not a board game where there's just set rules. You got to figure them out. Like the game is like in this game and like other tabletop RPGs is run by a specific person that runs the party through the game. And you can't get that with like other stuff. You just can't. Yeah. I think you have to build or have somebody that you trust that they can be an impartial person to run the game or that they're going to be fair uh, in the story. Yeah. Um, and I think finding that type of person, because if you have a couple of friends that you want to play with, for example, I've never been on the other, I've only been on this side of the table once when my brother ran the, the adventure mm. and my character died. I was very upset. Yeah, the first death of a character is <laughs> uh, always heartbroken or heartbreaking, yeah. Um, or, well, we didn't know how the rules of death worked. My mm. character hit zero hit points and we thought that that's when the oh, character Oh, you didn't know there was like the death saving throws and stuff? Correct. Oh. So in our so in the campaign or in the one adventure, the character died. But then after reading the rules and knowing that you have to do dead saving throws, now we all think like, well, it's not that he died; he's just unconscious yeah. in the dungeon, and he was abandoned as the party. Thought oh, so he's somewhere out there. He probably woke up one day and was like, "Where's my friends?" and just walked <laughs> off and did his own thing. 
<laughs> Correct. So, so that's maybe my hope. your original character <laughs> can have a comeback someday then if he DMs again or somebody else knows the DM. So he's always there for yeah. a catalog to use, which is super cool. Correct. So um, yeah. um, what, I, what I wanted to say was mainly that you have to either, if you're at the end, build trust or have players be, being able to trust you. So a lot of communication between you and your players or you being as transparent as possible with them yeah. goes a long way. And then if you're a player, you really have to have a person that you trust on the other side of the screen. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think I think having the sense of trust between the DM and their players is like a big thing like with the game. And that's something you guys should definitely like touch on like before you start playing. Like everybody has that session that that session zero where you get together, you make your characters, you talk about what the game you know, the campaign and story is gonna be like and kinda like collaborate then. And it's always good to build that sense of trust between like the DM and players, like, all right, we're gonna have this kind of game, these kinds of things are gonna happen. Are you guys okay with that? Are you okay if I do this? And I, I you know, um, I'm okay with you guys doing this. Are you okay with me doing this? You know, one of those things. I think that's always a good conversation to have, like, at your session zero before you guys mm -hmm. even start playing because the game's not any fun if you have a DM that's just out to kill his, like, his friends. Like, if you get a DM that wants to do, like, a hardcore grinder campaign where people come in and, you know, there's, there's death is just going to happen because it's going to be so hard, that's cool, but not everybody likes that. You know, some people want to come in. Like, personally, I like the collaborative storytelling, like the story arcs, the hooks, the character development type games more compared to mm -hmm. the hack and slash type ones but some people like both and that's cool but it's always good to have that understanding of trust between the two so you know everybody including the dm and the players have a thoroughly good experience yeah i think it's fine whichever uh, type of game is ran as as long as it's communicated and everybody mm -hmm. knows that that's the type of game that they're all playing yeah but yeah, if I'm playing a game where the DM tells me like it's gonna be like a meat grinder campaign where everybody's gonna come in and people are just gonna die because it's so hard, then I'm not I'm not gonna put you know an hour or two in my character's backstory. I'm just gonna make a dude and say he's an adventurer and he's out to do this and that's it. Because if he dies, I'm not gonna care about it. Then I have my characters where I know it's a developmental story game and everybody's in it to tell a collective story and have fun and you know have character development. Then that's what I'm gonna put like some time into a backstory, make a character that I really care about. And then if he dies, then I'm gonna be really sad. But at the same time, I you know I at least wrote a good story for him. Whereas if I don't want to come into a game and the DM doesn't tell us what it's like, then all of a sudden we go in and you die in the first combat encounter because it's so hard, you know. So it's always like you said, it's good to have that big trust, like a hundred percent. Yeah, I mean it's okay if it's at the end running the game for the first time. Uh, oh, yeah, everybody's got to learn. Yeah, big time. Mm -hmm. um, as long as um, the whole party knows, it's like hey. Uh, I'm running the game for the first time. Uh, it was a little bit more difficult yeah. than I had anticipated. And slack. This wasn't meant to happen. I apologize. <laughs> yeah, and that as happens. And that's, that's the thing with, you then. know, players, everybody's going to have their first time playing. Everybody's going to have their first time DMing. It's just going to happen. Like, so a DM mm -hmm. is going to make mistakes, you know, the first 10th, 100th, 1,000th time the DM. It's just going to happen. Like, but it's going to get progressively better. It just is. And then same with players. Like, you're going to come in, you know, if you're playing a new class that you've never played before, it's going to take you some time to learn that class. It's just it's just going to. So mm -hmm. mistakes are going to happen, but it's always good, mm -hmm. you know, just, just to, you know, sometimes just stick it through. Everybody learns together. The DM, you know, gets more comfortable with everything, and it just becomes, you know, a smooth process from there on out. After the, the, uh, the learning curve especially, you know, is taken care of. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I scratched my leg. Um, okay, so I know this part is going to take a little bit of time, so I want to get started on it um, now so we don't have a three-hour-long episode. So we talked about this a little before, you know, we started recording, and I told, we, you kind of mentioned at the beginning of this episode. Um, so we I'll leave it up to you. Uh, we talked about, you know, developing, like, one of, like, your kind of, like, posts that you, type, you like to do and, like, the process that goes behind it and, like, how you do it and kind of what we did the other night. Um, so why don't we go ahead and do something like that, kind of build a story arc or a character or whatever it happens to be that you're comfortable, you know, whatever you want to do for maybe the listeners, viewers, whatever it is to maybe get some inspiration off of this video for their upcoming mm -hmm. campaign or game they're going to play. Mm -hmm. So I think the easiest one is always the story hook because, mm -hmm. uh, you can just, if by asking the right question, you can come up with, with just the entire campaign idea if you'd like to. Oh yeah. Um, when I do the NPCs, I kind of try to um, also have images at the same time. So as I try to come up with something, like the image kind of relates to, to the person I'm trying to create. So for the sake of uh, making it as easy and as, as smooth as possible, I think the, the story hook would be the best idea in this case. Okay, that's fine. 
So do you want to start off with a simple idea like you did the one night, and then we can kind of go back and forth with each other and see what we can do? Uh, okay. Um, Perfect. So the way that I do it is I go online and I find tons of um, already story hooks that have been created by the community. Um, no matter where you go, if you try to book a story hook generator or adventure generator for Dungeons and Dragons, you have, I don't know, hundreds or thousands of prompts. Yeah, I actually ended up, up I actually ended up looking online because you told me you do that. I went online. I'm like, I wonder what there is. And I went online. There's like generators like galore. There's tons of like pre-made ones already. They're just like idea. They're like one liners even like sentences like this is it built off of it. Or there's a generator mm-hmm. where it builds everything. And I was like, oh, my mm-hmm. God, there's so much stuff like I've always yeah, been one to like sit down and like, all right think and brainstorm like this is what's going to happen these are the things this is the stuff and then i was like why have i not been doing this in the past why have i not been looking at like generators so you just get like simple ideas off of and just like build from them like why why didn't i do any of this and so like after that night when you said all that i was like i wonder what there is and i looked and i'm like oh my god there's so much i can use this stuff for the (laughs) upcoming season of our podcast so i've actually been doing a lot of that ever since that night which is really cool um so yeah all right so story hook that works we can do that like a, a plot um type uh you know, idea. So what are you thinking for the initial, like, uh, starting line? Um, so the way that I've been doing it is um, after, if you keep browsing online, there's going to be some really compelling ones that you can just build an entire campaign mm. off of. And then there are some that are very simple that are kind of frustrating for me specifically. because Yeah, they're too they vague don't... to really build off of. Yeah, mm. so those are the ones that I like to build on top of because I think that's where people kind of have the most trouble. Like, they see something that is so simple and they would get stressed out. It's like, I don't know how this can help me. Yeah. So I want to try to use uh, a couple of those. I have, like, so I have it in front of me. I have, like, probably hundreds. Awesome. And then I just copy-paste every time I find one. Yeah, yeah, that's smart. Um, so this one, uh, um, I'm just picking one at random. Yep, Let's do the Sacred Spear has gone missing okay um so for me specifically that is something that would annoy me a lot because <laughs> how because uh, of how big it is yeah it's like okay there's a spear uh it's sacred and it has gone missing so it has already for me three like i know it's annoying when i start asking too many questions okay um uh, just by reading the thing and i'm like why is it sacred uh why does it have to be a spear why is it not something else oh because then you gotta think of like why is it a spear why is it sacred and there's you gotta do more thinking okay that makes sense correct so with that in mind uh what i do is try to answer all of those questions okay so in this case i want to use you to see what you come up with gotcha uh, for those specific questions so we have a sacred spear that has gone missing Um, okay so I don't know if you have any ideas already in mind and you want to give out some context well, as to I would as to what the spear is all about. I would say maybe the spear belonged to um, maybe like an ancient, maybe not ancient, but like a legendary, um, you know, like fighter or like, you know, a marshal in the army. And he like led like the army to victory at like some point in time. And the spear was like a signature weapon. And like after like his death and stuff, it was like, his uh like his idol and they like they like, showcased it and like all that kind of stuff um and it was like he maybe had like high value because he was like the army general and you know he he led like you know a big army to victory that like saved their like country or land or whatever it happens to be and it was all thanks to him and you know after he died and they took a spear and they put it like in a showcase in the city and like they protected it you know because it was like very just you know sacred to like them and like their the meaning behind it and whatnot um but then because of it being sacred on top of that you know you know maybe being sacred on the sense that like the the guard used it and he's like this big like you know army guard that was like leading people maybe he was also a great leader because maybe the spear had you know some sort of like you know enchantment to it or it was like had some magical properties and that's why he was so um easily able to encourage his troops to join in battle and like you know not die and survive in the in the midst of battle so maybe somebody found out about you know, why the spear was so sacred, why he was able to accomplish everything he did, and then they took it for his own either good or evil reasons. Okay, so um, I don't know. For anybody that listens to what you just said, which is a lot of information, right? Yeah, it is. For me, me, that's something that I would never be able to come up with. 
Oh, uh, okay. My brain doesn't work like that at all. I don't have the inspiration for uh, for that amount of fantasy in my head. Um, so, just I'm gonna take all of that information and I'm gonna make it as simple as possible. Okay, and say simple is better. I, I, I prefer simple I'll, over big paragraphs. Trust me. No. <laughs> yeah. It's, so you you can go ahead and let your flow as much as as you want but i kind of want to make it that for anybody that listens to that specific example mm -hmm. that they don't overcomplicate things and just take a one-liner um, and just like here it is this is what they said in like correct. one sentence okay perfect yeah so, do that. so what you said was basically uh there's there, there's a sacred spear there was a general who was uh quite adept mm -hmm. with um with managing the spear uh winning a lot of battles with it um and the spear is also magical so with that being said um i kind of want to put myself into this scenario like how long ago was this general alive like managing the spear was it centuries ago was it a decade ago was it a thousand years ago uh how many zeros behind that oh okay i didn't even think about that Ooh. Mm, I would and, say and this is for whoever wants to come up with a number, they just yeah. They can yeah this, this can be anybody. If you're listening to this right, right now, this can answer, yeah. yeah, this can be anybody. You know, they don't, don't got to do exactly what we're doing. We're just like I said, I'm just snowballing stuff and seeing what we can come up with because I think that you know the way you go about this is really cool. Um, I would say maybe like not an extraordinary amount of time ago. I'd say maybe like a thousand years ago, not like ten thousand years. But I'll say maybe like a thousand years is like a good like ancient like artifact type number. Okay, and if he won uh, a lot of battles, do you know how many or why were the battles significant? Why was he at war? Um. Oh God. <laughs> Shit. Um. I would have to say maybe they were at war. Um. Hmm. Now I got a brainstorm. I want to say maybe their country was under attack. And mm -hmm. then by something, I don't know why you have to think about that, but their country is under attack by somebody or something, and they were on the brink of losing the war. Um, but he encouraged and, you know, it rallied the troops to rise up, and he ended up attaining this spear by mm -hmm. some means, and he was able to help th overthrow this invading army when they thought all hope was gone. Um, so therefore, you know, that's why he was able to, you know, make it such a, such a significant weapon is because when all hope was lost, you know, they thought they'd be taken over and enslaved. He comes up and he's able to, you know, just, you know, empower his, his troops and his army and help overthrow, you know, the invading army of whatever it is. And then he eventually won the final battle and drove out the bad guys, whoever they happened to be back to their homelands, um, and successfully, you know, freed their country from future, uh, you know, enslavement. Okay, so I want also uh, when like I'm giving an item, uh, have the item do something uh, that no other item has done before, like something very specific, like some accomplishment that was done with this item. Uh, in this case, if it's a spear, it could be uh, that the spear was used to pierce uh, something specific, could be an armor or a creature or the evil bad guy or a specific organ or some sort of thing some, uh, if you're giving an item you usually want it to represent or that it does something meaningful or that it did something meaningful at least at one point so i kind of want to give you the option to to see what the spear was capable of doing okay i would say um maybe the spear had like an enhanced version of the um the battle cry ability which battle cry um it gives surround it's like i think it's like a 100 foot radius but it gives like a 100 foot radius of like allies advantage and all, all their attacks um okay. for like a full round but i want to say maybe the spear did it for more than one round and maybe had like a bigger radius than just 100 feet so maybe okay. that was the, so... one of the big magical properties and then maybe it probably did like you know uh since it's magical technically um, you know, if it's magical from giving the, the radius of the, you know, the, the battle cry effect, maybe it also did, you know, like D12, or not, not the D12, like maybe like a D12 plus something mm -hmm. of magical damage, because normally a spear is like a D6 or D8, so maybe it had mm -hmm. like a little stronger buff to it, and it did magical damage too to get past like magical resistances or non-magical resistances, um, so I think that would be, you know, something decent. Because it's going to rally awesome. the troops together with uh, the battle cry ability. That's why they were able to rise up. They all got their advantage on their attacks. They were able to keep on swinging without missing. And then in the end, the spear was also stronger than, you know, maybe like finely crafted. So it was stronger than a regular spear too. 
Okay, so the way that I see it, and when what you just said about being able to use the spear to use um, a magic spell, is something that I love adding uh, to a lot of the things that I come up with as well. Uh, that whoever is the owner of the spear, perhaps it requires attunement. Mm -hmm. So uh, the spear has to tune to its wielder. And then whoever is attuned to that spear can cast a certain spell with it. Yeah. Uh, in this case, you're saying like a, an enhanced ability of a battle cry. Uh, but for anybody listening, it could be anything. Yeah, it, it doesn't be have any, to be battle any cry. Any yeah. spell that they, they want, that they feel like it's meaningful for their specific campaign, they can just pick a spell like it's a spear, a magical spear. It requires attunement. Uh, if you're um, wielding and you're attuned to the spear, you can cast a specific um, spell. So now going forward into when the spear has gone missing, uh, we're now uh, present time. The spear has gone missing. So for me, is uh, where was the spear originally? And how did people find out that it, it, it went missing? Mm. I would say maybe it was at like some sort of like RK museum. Um, maybe there's like a you know a big like history, um, like museum or like showcase of like you know ancient things that have happened in the past in whatever country or realms like uh, lands this is where people can go and like honor the fallen or you know see the the true legends of the magic weapons used or those types of things. So maybe they had that. Like it was maybe it was like the most grand like item that they had there at this arcane like library or um, museum for people to go see and like honor, you know, the fallen from the final battle of the war. Mm -hmm. And it was up there, heavily guarded, um, you know, always on like a twenty four hour watch by like whoever happens to be, you know, in, in the city, you know, at the King's Guard or whatever happens to be. Um, but then, you know, so made that also adds to the hook of like how did they go missing when it was always guarded too. So maybe it was like on show, um, heavily guarded, you know, like as a, an honorable uh, display to represent the fallen and whatnot. Um, so I'd say maybe something along the lines of that. Okay, and then does that mean that in present time, uh, even though people know that the spear, do people know that the spear is magical, like that it's able to do what we know it can do? I would say maybe not everybody knows that it's magical. I would say maybe, you know, they it's probably displayed in this like arcane museum as the weapon of so and so, the the legendary leader of this army who led the or their, our troops to victory a thousand years ago against the army of orcs or whatever it happens to be. So they know it's his weapon. The main reason they go to see it is because they know this is his weapon. He used this in the final battle. It's a signature thing, like this is what we have to honor him, that's why it's on show. So the people that are guarding it and the people at the Arcane Library would probably know that it's magical. However, regular civilians probably would not. Because, you know, for to the naked eye, it's probably just like a regular spear. And, you know, the troops in battle and war probably didn't even know they were having that spell casted on them, you know. They just all of a sudden felt like they were empowered and, like, full of energy because of this awesome leader they had. So maybe mm -hmm. not the general population knows that it's magical, but somebody somehow found out that it was. Okay, now, um, is it also assumed that in the present time, the, like, civilizations are not at work, at, at war currently? Is it possible that they're at war right now? Yeah, is it possible that they're at war? Because if, if they know, if they're, what I'm thinking is, like, if you're at war and you have and the knowledge that this item exists, would you be using the item? Or would you still be wanting to display it? Or, like, is there current conflict in the world that we live in? Or is the um, the generator of the conflict is the fact that they stole the spear and that generates the conflict of the story? I would say maybe there's, like, a secret conflict going on. So maybe the ancestors of the army that was defeated, you know, a thousand years ago, they, mm -hmm. they somehow found out that the spear is the reason they lost the war. So maybe they are looking to get the spear, and they do magically somehow, you know, obtain it somehow, to seek revenge on that country and their people for what they did to them a thousand years ago. And they're going to use the spear to get back at them and try to take over the lands once again, but this time with the magic of, you know, whatever the name of the spear is. So maybe there is not a war or conflict yet, because I feel like if the country 
at itself was at war, then they would definitely use that spear if they knew it was magical. Like, the, the top leader tiers of the country. Whereas, if there's no conflict going on right now, then somebody took it to do something with it blatantly. They're not just going to steal it and display it. So, I would probably say it was, you know, maybe, like, the old army or, like, the ancestors of, like, the old army that attacked the country originally that ended up somehow finding it, stealing it, and using it to their advantage or, or plan on building another army to use it towards their advantage. Okay, so um, I don't know if I'm the only one that does this, but I'm always on the train of thought that if you are the one holding the spear, then you are the good guys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then whoever is fight, uh, you're fighting against are the evil, um, the evil guys. It's probably biased towards uh, good people, but I guess we're yeah. all good people in general. <laughs> Um, so with that being said, I kind of want to ask, uh, if it's possible for you to, um, uh, name the race that the good guys are and the race that the evil guys are to give them more personality. Mm, I don't want to say humans cause that's too cliche and typical. Uh, I'm going to go with elves, like it's an mm -hmm. elven kingdom and it was mm -hmm. their spear and they, you know, because they're high pristine, you know, maybe that's why, maybe that's why it's magical. Maybe that's why it was crafted so pristine, like precise, because, you know, elven forgery for like weapons like that are always very, um, you know, high class and pristine. And I want to say probably, you know what, let's do the elves versus the dark elves. Cause that's always a good, you know, that that's a very good thing to go for. So maybe, oh, okay. Maybe the drow and dark elves were able to rise from the underdark shadow fell. Cause that's where they reside. They rose up somehow. They tried to take over the Elven Kingdom to make it their own. They, it almost happened during the war. The High Elves and Wood Elves were able to push back the Dark Elves back to their homelands. And that was it ever since. Now they found a way back. They found out about the spear. They got the spear. They're taking it back. They're making a new army to invade the Elven Kingdom once again. Yep, yeah, and I think it's also easy for Elves to kind of know the story of the spear because Elves can live for a very Yeah, hundreds long of years, time. yeah. Mm -hmm. So it is possible that, like, even the parents of the current elves know uh, or fought against the spear or with yeah. the spear. Yeah, I think that's why a thousand years would be kind of nice because it's like it's one of those things where, for an elf, you know, a thousand years is not it's long, but it's not maybe insanely two long. generations. Yeah, like two or three <laughs> generations. That's about it. So it's like, oh, like my ancestors, like my my grandfather used this spear in the war, you know, or my grandfather fought with this man in the war and blah 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 so they would like still have some familiarity about what's going on like oh no they're back a thousand years later you know it's not this thing that happened two or twenty thousand years ago this happened you know mm -hmm. uh, now is there a final plot as to what they really want to do with the spear mm, the dark elves probably mm -hmm. i would say there's probably some sort of new general Maybe like an ancestor of one of the the old Dark Elf army generals that was killed. Um, he found out about this. You know, whatever happens, like happenstance, whatever happens to be. He probably literally just wants to use it to rally troops and just invade. And then if they succeed, he's probably, instead of displaying it because they're power hungry, he's probably going to keep it for himself for as long as he can. Okay. So that's and then possibly maybe the start invading other countries too, not just the Elven one, you know, use it to take over the Elven one. And then from the Elven one, they go to like a human one. And then, you know, the Dark Elves <laughs> are taking over with this, sure. this damn spear. Uh, so now we have the world and the entire setting uh, pretty much set up. We have a backstory. Uh, we have a legendary item. Uh, we have already conflict between two uh, different parties. So what I want to do and what I always try to do in every story hook is that um, usually people get attached to some of the characters that you create during this setting. Yeah. But, but those will be NPCs that you can use for your story. Um, I, don't, I don't want people to try to play any of the roles, for example, of, of the general from the Dark Elves or from the general from the... Uh, from the high elf, I'm assuming. <laughs> yeah, we'll do high elf, what um, elf, whatever happens to be. So I want somebody to be neutral or to to not be in the story that we just came up with, but somebody that the audience or the party member or anybody could be the main character of this entire story. Mm -hmm. So what would compel a main character 
which we're trying to make a good campaign here. Uh, if it was an evil campaign, then we'll go yeah, for that. Yeah, because the cool thing is you can go either a... side with this. You could do a campaign mm -hmm. from either Correct. side. You could be the Dark Elves <laughs> or you could be the High Elves. You know, it doesn't matter. Correct. So we're going to stick with, like, trying to be trying to make it a the good, good guys, campaign. guys, yeah. It's always fun. So, so uh, if you live in this world where uh, you know about the war, you know about the conflict between the Dark Elves and the High Elves, you know about the spear, what would compel you to act uh, upon seeing what just happened, upon seeing that the spear has gone missing? Mm. Why would you be compelled to do something about it if you live in this world, as opposed to, like, I don't care about this, I'm just going to go on my merry way? <laughs> like, mm. why are you compelled to act? Maybe one of your ancestors is wasn't in the war, because I feel like that's really cliche, like, oh, my grandpa used that spear, you know, whatever. Maybe instead of that, maybe you are related to the person that made it a thousand years ago. So uh, That made the spear? Yeah. So maybe you are related to the uh, the group of sorcerers <laughs> or wizards, uh, elven, you know, crafters that made this spear, and you hear it's gone missing, and you go like, you're just like, I got to figure out what happened to my ancestor's spear that they made and crafted, you know, because you would know as a person – because your ancestors made it, you would probably know compared to the rest of civilization that this thing is magical as hell, and you know if it gets in the wrong hands, then some bad stuff can happen. Whereas a regular civilian probably wouldn't know. They probably just think it's a regular spear. If you're related to the people that made it, and like your mother told you a story about how your grandmother crafted this great spear for the legendary elven warrior, then you would know, have an inkling like, okay, if, if grandma was very pristine in magic use, this gets in the wrong hands, then some shit's going to go down. Okay, so I think the last thing that I would want to add to it, based on everything you're saying, is um, there is then something that the spear can do that only a few people know, mm -hmm. but they haven't done it. Like the general from a thousand years ago didn't know that the spear was capable of doing this. Okay, so it has uh, like some hidden so, potential to it. Yeah, so what would that be? What do you think the spear is able to do? Uh, whether it's in the right hands or in the wrong hands, it's just capable of doing something that that people didn't know a thousand years ago. Mm, that's a good one. Ooh, I gotta think. Because I, I don't want to be cliche. Like, I'm not a big cliche person. Like, oh, it does ice damage. Like, no, I want to think of something like very... Um different ooh what about uh hmm what about like like interplanar travel like the spear can be used to open gateways to like another plane of existence okay and then well then the question would be like why would they want to open uh plane gate oh that's fair to, like i know that the the dark helps are just stealing the spear, but if they know that it can do that, why are they trying to do that? Why did the Dark Elves steal it, or why did they craft it to be like that? What, or why do they want to open gate to go to a different plane of existence? Uh, they would either A, want to open it to get to their own plane of existence, to get out of their current living state, because maybe it's shitty, or maybe they would want to open... Ooh, no, the Dark Elves want to get it because they want to get revenge on the High Elves for banishing them to a dark place. So they're going to open up a different plane of existence and send the High Elves to an even darker place as revenge so they know what it's like as they take over their country. Okay. So, yeah, that's it. I think that I think that took about 20 minutes. I'm sorry that it took so no, long. No, that's fine. But... <laughs> yeah, I planned on it. Yeah, that's that's what, that's how I, I really wanted to, you know, maybe close this out because, like I said, the process is really cool. Maybe it'll get people's brains thinking, you know, and, you know, have a, a different understanding of way to – Go about story writing, storytelling, uh, plot hooks, and whatnot. I think it's, uh, I think working together with that kind of stuff, you know, like kind of how we did. If you give me ideas, and me bouncing off of them is always a good way to come up with, you know, whether it's store ideas, campaign ideas, NPCs, items, whatever it happens to be. Mm -hmm. And you know, hopefully, you know, maybe somebody will use this for their campaign coming up because that's what this yeah. is all about, you know. And I think mostly uh, the main thing, like I know that for a podcast, and I know that we did an introduction, and then we did the the, the whole exercise. The exercise, like I timed it; it's literally like twenty minutes and one second. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, so right there in twenty minutes, you got a, a campaign with a plot hook. Right now, it, it, it's there. <laughs> correct. Yeah, and and that's usually I think a lot of dungeons.
investors that are just starting out get a writer's block where they don't know mm -hmm. where to take their campaign or their story or they don't know where to begin how to end it how to progress i think just by asking uh, the right question you're able to get to the next step yeah and obviously it's easy when you're bouncing ideas with somebody but the way that when i try to get answers when i don't have somebody to bounce ideas from uh, or with i i just look up images so if i look at a spear yeah I visual art sometimes spear, yeah and, it and then i i say like oh this kind of gives me an idea yeah um so it's just that and, and i'm pretty sure in 20 minutes as opposed to people say like oh creating oh, it took me hours and hours took me days and yeah, yeah, it took me such a long time. It, it was days of work and weeks, and yeah. I didn't know where I was going to take it. Literally, it, it can be just in 20 minutes. It can, you can, yeah. You can just develop the entire yeah, thing. Yeah, and the thing is, like, even from that, like, so you have your, your, your basis that we just made. Even from that, you can still build off of it, you know. But, but now you have, your, you have your first stone that you can build mm -hmm. off of. So it's like, all right, here's my general thing. Okay, cool. Maybe I can add this small piece to it, and I can add, I can add this small piece to it. But those small pieces you add to it can be added at a later date too, as the campaign progresses. But you know, I feel like the hardest part is you know getting kind of what we just did, and that's getting the collective main plot and story down. Which a lot of people, I think, like you said, they overcomplicate it and they think way too much into it. They spend hours and hours having writing blocks, you know, and it's a pain in the ass sometimes. But um the, yeah that exercise is definitely it, it works very well you know it's very simple too it's like one of those things where it's like oh that's super easy like why am i not doing that I'm like that's why i said my said that's why i said to greg after we got offline the one night i was like why are we not doing this the right campaign he's like man i don't know and i'm like all right well we're gonna start doing that kind of stuff so um yeah definitely really good um hopefully somebody uses it if you guys yeah. use that by chance you know let me know in the comments or whatever that'd be really cool yeah, so with that in mind, I'll probably just based out of that entire idea, I'll create a post. Awesome. Uh, post it on Instagram, and then once this video is up, I'll just mention everybody. It's like, hey, this was something that. Uh, so I know how to kind of phrase the Instagram post, so it it is still sparks more ideas. Inspiration, yeah. Yeah, inspiration that people say, like, I know where I can take this. And people take it to different places. Yeah, but you, you word them really well. Like They're very pleasing to read as well, too. So <laughs> Nice, thank you. So uh, I'll do that, and then, I don't know, see what comments people post on that. Yeah, I see definitely. See if they took it in a completely different direction. If they want to see uh, how the story actually was developed, uh, they can look at the video. Uh, yeah hear the podcast whatever it is absolutely so we'll just bounce back and forth between those two awesome that sounds really really good so no um yeah we're gonna wrap this up um thanks everybody for listening you know if you use this uh this story we kind of developed you know uh that we you know did for you guys maybe you can uh you know uh angle it to your own way if you do use it uh you know comment down below let us know what you use what you changed kept it the same if you liked it a lot you know let us know i mean or maybe you know you just took small bits and pieces of it and added your campaign. You know, that's what this is all about. This is why we do this super enjoyable. I want to help others. And, uh, Carlos, I believe you do, you do too. Um, you know, with writing games yeah. and stuff, uh, according to your, your Instagram, because, uh, thousands of followers follow you and like your posts every day because of how good they are. So, <laughs> um, thank you so much. So that is going to be it. Thanks guys for listening to another episode of Cantrip conversations. Uh, again, if you're listening on Spotify, iTunes, whatever you listen to your podcast on, you can follow us on the Cantrip Cast on YouTube. That is the Cantrip Cast at YouTube. Um, you know, we put these episodes these episodes out a week early on YouTube compared to our iTunes, Spotify, and podcast pages. But if you're listening on iTunes, Spotify, whatever it is, that's fine too. Thank you for the support, no matter what it is. You can find, however, if you are on YouTube, this is another bonus. You can find the link to uh, Carlos's Instagram page down below. You will see it in the the comment, well, not the comments, in the description. It's gonna be plus five charisma on Instagram so go follow him he's got some really cool stuff on there you're gonna get a lot of inspiration of everything he posted really cool really fun uh is there anything else you want me to kind of like put in the description while we're talking about it or is that your, your main thing is instagram isn't it yeah that's it all right I think yeah I wasn't sure he had like a twitter we'll and all that kind of stuff we have a no, twitter eventually. but i barely use it like i don't i'm not a big twitter fan so. Same. I, have, I have two tweets that's it yeah i think we have we have a couple on our podcast thing but i'm i'm more of an instagram and youtube guy myself so we have a facebook as well but that's more for like personal friends and stuff to see instagram youtube are big too aside from the podcast mm -hmm. but um that is it guys thank you so much for listening and we will catch you guys on another episode of cantrip conversations very soon mm -hmm.